Hey, and welcome to uh, you down with MMT. Basically, I'm doing a series of three chapters from the uh, MMT uh, macroeconomic book uh, by William Mitchell, always known as Bill Mitchell, L. Randall Ray, and Martin Watts. Uh, I'm on chapter eight, I believe. Let me double check that. Yes, eight. Uh, the use of framing and language in macroeconomics. Uh and just so you know, chapter nine, I believe, is government spending. So we'll get more and more into the MMT perspective as far as that part goes. Anywho, uh, back to the task at hand. Uh, starting on page 119, introduction 8.1, words matter. From the time you were a, you're, you were a baby, your, your parents and other guardians told you uh, stories designed to teach you how to behave. The little engine that could uh, caught, taught the value of perseverance, yurtled the turtle, instilled in your passionate passion and willingness to would stand up against tyrant and tyranny. Uh, Grimm's fairy tales warned of the danger of straying too far from parental protection. Uh, words and lessons you, you you learned in childhood stick with you, and they are imprinted in your brain, and you can be easily triggered. Uh, and can be easily triggered. If someone utters the word witch, this will likely trigger an old memory of one of the stories you were told as a child. Sometimes you cannot get these memories out of your mind. George Lakoff, an expert in, lingu in linguistics, uh, provides the following example. He tells readers, in quotes, or yeah, anyway, in parentheses, I guess, I'm not sure. Uh, don't think of an elephant. Uh, try as you might, you will think of an elephant. If, yeah, uh, if, if you want to go on to say, uh, if you go on to say, whatever you do, do not think of Dumbo. Most of you, especially those raised in Western countries, will think of the character from the popular child, child children's book and Disney movie. Uh, those who uh, those big floppy ears stick uh, in your mind and make the make it harder to think of anything else. There is more to this than simply associating a world or word uh, elephant with a vision, the picture of Dumbo that you recall from childhood. Modern science teaches us that uh, humans think using stories, many of them learned long, uh, long ago as a child. In the thinking process, cognition, you adapt these old stories to new situations to make sense of the world. Advertisers make use of the modern science of cognition to invoke associations between products that they are trying to sell and neural networks that are neural <laughs> networks that have already been implanted in your brain. For example, a toilet bowl cleaner is pitched by associating it with a younger smiling mother who cares for the cute and happy uh, toddler. Politicians uh, also use science to trigger both good and bad associations to uh, win votes. For example, a politician who is running uh, on a tough on crime platform will habitually uh, refer to a notorious case to trigger fear in the minds of voters. American President Ronald Reagan famously told a story about a welfare queen mother who drives a Cadillac during his campaign to associate welfare programs with cheaters and wasteful spending. Economists unavoidably use the stories to communicate their beliefs, although they often do not realize that the way they frame their arguments can promote or hinder the lesson that they are trying to teach. Nor do they always understand what neural networks the words they use will trigger in the minds of the audience. For example, the word of debt is necessarily a loaded term with associations of imprudent, imprudence, burden, and default. Once the neuro network associated with these stories are fired up, it is extremely difficult to avoid putting negative connotations onto the word and thus the concept of debt. In general, conservative economists have been much more aware of the science of cognition and have successfully used it to pervasively embedded the, excuse me, embedded their ideology into economic discourse, including in the classroom and in the policymaking sphere. 
Unfortunately, progressive economists have generally adopted the conservatives' terminology and framing, undercutting their attempt to provide an alternative to the dominant conservative approach to economics. In this textbook, we strive to use language that is consistent with our progressive approach to economics. In this chapter, we will discuss how language and framing is important to teaching the modern monetary theory alternative, or MMT. 8.2. MMT and Public Discourse. This textbook provides an integrated, inter, inter, in, integrated exposition of MMT, which stands to contra contradiction to the mainstream macroeconomics that is taught in many universities and is dominant in policy-making circles. In this chapter, we discuss the way in which framing and language are used to advocate conceptual ideas and how people can be persuaded to believe for propositions that have no foundation in reality. Learning the importance of framing and language is a precondition for gaining fundamental grasp of what is, no, uh, what is knowledge and what is not. Macroeconomics concepts such as real GDP, inflation, the unemployment rate, the fiscal deficit, and the interest rate make headline, uh, headlines on a daily basis. Finance uh, segments on national news broadcasts increasingly discuss macroeconomic issues with frequent recourse to complex terms and are not well understood by many media uh, commentators or the public. Consequently, from the outset, the public discourse contains significant errors that render it almost impossible to participate participants, rather, to make an informed assessments of macroeconomic developments ind independently of the associated politics. Economic concepts such as government uh, fiscal deficit contain nuances that make an uh, unambiguous assess assessment of their meaning difficult. One cannot conclude, for example, that deficit equals to two year, uh, two year, excuse me, two percent of GDP signals a more expansionary fiscal stance by government than a deficit of half that size or half the size. These complexities are lost to the public, but are fundamental uh, to an accurate understanding of the issues. Social media exacerbates the, this problem. The so-called Blogosphere is populated with self-styled macroeconomics, including myself, no, uh, experts, whose claims about such things as the state of the government finances are erroneous at best. Appeals to common sense and reliance on logic or, uh, or intuition have all become dangerous norms in these forums. Reinforcing, excuse me. Uh, reinforcing the argument that not all opinion should be given equal privilege uh, in public discourse. Our uh, propensity to generalize from personal experience as if that experience uh, equates to general knowledge continually leads these Facebook macroeconomics de debates into combative dead ends of false reasoning from false prop propositions. The problem inherent in communication, complex economic concepts and evidence are amplified by the ideological uh, assumptions that currently de uh, de uh, dominate the public debate. Econ economics as an academic discipline has uh, come to be defined by a set of beliefs that are associated with uh, dominating a dominant free market paradigm. The consequences of uh, that is narrow debate that excludes the lessons of history and the possibility of alternative economic paradigms that offer realistic insights into current economic conditions and related policy options. Conservative think tanks and media outlets uh, produce an array of research on or I mean research or policy reports such as or such that the pol public understanding has become, Straight jacketed by orthodox concepts and conclusions that in themselves are erroneous, but also lead to policy outcomes that undermine the prosperity of subvert public uh, purpose. 
the public's willingness to tolerate uh, mass unemployment, raising income inequality and poverty is a manifestation of the uh, of the system uh, sy sim syndrome. There we go. Prior to the uh, GFC or uh, global financial crisis, mainstream economists pronounced the business cycle dead and declared that we had entered a period of great moderation. A stock in Watson in 2002, Lucas 2003, and Bernanke 2004. These economists categorically failed to foresee the catastrophic consequence of the policy of deregulation of the labor and financial markets that they promoted. It is reasonable to expect the professional failure on the scale of GFC, which or would have would have led to a reevaluation of the paradigm within the economist's work and to major changes in economic uh, circula, curricula and research. Uh, mainstream economists, however, fail to alter their uh, teaching uh, approaches in significant ways or any significant ways. The fact that mainstream macroeconomics has retained its uh, hegemonic uh, status uh, you know, status in the face of its failure to resonate with reality is due to, in no smart and small uh, measure to the way uh, econom economics debates are framed in the public discourse. Framing ref uh, refers to the way an argument is conceptualized and communicated by speakers and listeners. Conceptual models and representatives are used in this process. Research in cognitive philosophy and cognitive uh, linguistics suggest that the models that constrain our thinking operate at a large unconscious level and that the abstract uh, concepts were draw on, uh, drawn on are largely metaphor metaphorical, imaginative, and emotionally engaged. Lockoff and Johnson, 99 and 3 to 4. As was referenced, I guess. Proponents of neoclassical macroeconomics have been extremely successful in their use of common metaphors to advance their ideology, uh, ideological uh, interest, ideological uh, loaded myths in modern pa uh, uh, parlance. Uh, fake knowledge are accepted unchanged by the public uh, as truths. Thus, ide uh, ideology triumphs over evidence, and we accept falsehoods as truth. Recent psychological studies have highlighted the extent to which pre-existing biases influence the way in which we inter interpret factual information, including straightforward statistical data. This presents a further problem for the communication of uh, research finding that may be counterintuitive or controversial or that challenge the dominant discourse about public policy designed as the case of economic austerity or climate change. Further, it is often the case that the language that is used to advocate a progressive alternative actually serves to reinforce conservative myths. See Lokoff, 2010, Bray, 2013. It has been suggested that language is to, is so important in learning that there is a need to develop new terms that are not associated with orthodox econom economics in order to communicate a new progressive macroeconomics such as developed in, te in this textbook. But there is a tension between any benefits that may accrue from the development of such a new language and the necess necessity to couch the argument in terminology that the public are familiar with then uh, with then discussing economic outcomes there remain then no yeah there remains a role for better education of essential concepts in addition to a reconsideration of how the concepts are related in this textbook we base our expand uh, exposition around mmt which is a coherent Macroeconomic narrative providing, per, yeah, per, uh, proving, excuse me, no, providing new insights into the policy uh, opportunities available to government and the likely and the likely outcomes. MMT has struggled to gain traction in wider economic and, and political debates due to one the, an incom, uh, incomplete understanding of key macroeconomic terms among. Economy, economics uh, co commentators, especially journalists and the wi wider com community, including policymakers and the public, uh, general public, and three, oh, no, sorry, two, the, develop the deployment of 
key macroeconomic terms in the context, all pervasive culture uh, metaphors to support policy interventions that effectively benefit a privileged few at the expense of the majority. In this chapter, we have already in this chapter we have already provided a brief conceptual basis for understanding how the language we use constraints our constraints our thinking. We we will go on to examine some of the key metaphors used to reinforce the flawed message message of orthodox econom, uh, economics. Economics. There we go. Eight point three. Two visions of the economy. Schenker, uh, Osorio, uh, 2012, and uh, I can I can I can never really understand how to pronounce it, but it's uh, juxtaposes ju juxtaposes two visions of the economy. Uh, this figure uh, 8.1 represents the conservative mainstream econ economics view where the basic consumption is that people and nature exist primarily to serve the economy. Uh, Schenker, Osorio, 2012, location 439. Okay, I'm not really sure what that means. Anyway, this narrative uh, tells us that a competitive, self-regulated economy will deliver maximum wealth and income if left free from the government intervention. The economy is enshrined as an entity, almost a de deity, you know, uh, deity, that is essentially beyond our control, uh, although it recognizes our endeavors and rewards, or punishes us accordingly. We are required to have faith, work hard, and make the necessary sacrifices for the good of the, eco of the economy. Those who do not are rightfully deprived of such rewards. The economy is also constructed as a living entity. If the government in intervenes in the competitive process and provides an avenue by which the underserving, lazy, and so and so on can also receive rewards, then the system becomes sick. The solution is to restore the economy's natural processes, its health, which entails the elimination of government interventions such as minimum wage, job protection, and income support. The key message the key messages are self-governing and natural, which which force the obvious conclusion that a government intrusion does more harm than good, and we just had to accept current economic hardships. Uh, also, Shankar Osorio, 2012, location 386. I'm not really sure what that means again, but whatever. Um, could be a book they both did, who knows. Uh, anyway, although subscribers to this view would have us believe that this is a rational narrative, in fact, in rep it represents a type of magical thinking more appropriately associated with medieval views on the relationship between uh, individuals and the world. The narrative teaches us that our own success or failure is due primarily to our own efforts, and these are considered to be independent from the success of the system. The extent to which private health, private wealth can be seen as a link to social economic status and stable, high-quality infrastructure is mis mis minimized. In the view. Similarly, the unemployed are seen as being as being responsible for their jobless status, when in reality, a systemic shortage of jobs explain their plight. This narrative is so powerful that progressive politicians and commentators have become a, become seduced into offering fairer alternatives to the mainstream solution rather than challenging assumptions behind them not root uh, behind them root and branch. For example, progressive timely, uh, timidly advanced uh, advocates more gradual fiscal austerity when they should be com uh, comprehensively rejecting it on the basis of evidence that it fails. And advocating larger deficits to solve the massive rates of uh, labor underutilization that burdens most economies. Progressives and conservatives are hostage to the same erroneous beliefs about the way the economy operates and the public is uh, compelled to believe there is no alternative, or Tina, as, it, as it's, I guess, called, uh, to the d d damaging economic policies being introduced. And figure six, uh, figure eight point two rather represents an alternative view of the economic where the, the economy works for us as our construction and people are organ are organically embedded within and are nurtured by this natural environment. According to the uh, accordingly, 
the, the economy is seen as a constructed object, object and policy uh, interventions around it. And it should only be appraised. We are praised in terms of reaching our broad goals, which uh, a progressive vision would articulate in terms of advancing public well-being and minimize, uh, maximizing excuse me, the potential for all citizens within the uh, limits of environmental sustainability. The focus then shifts to, to one of placing our human goals at the center of our thinking about the, econo the economy, which ec echoes the principles of functional finance. Learner, 1943, consistent with this, MMP highlights the irrelevance of a narrow focus on the fiscal balance without reference to a broader human context. In this narrative, uh, in this narrative, people create the economy. There is nothing ne uh, neutral, natural, human about it. Concepts such as a natural rate of un unemployment, which uh, which imply that it should be left to its own uh, equal. Equilibrating, equilibrating, uh, yes, forces to reach its natural state are erroneous. Governments can always choose and sustain a particular unemployment rate. We, wait, uh, we create, uh, we create a government as our agent to do, uh, to do things that we cannot easily do ourselves, and we understand that. The economy will only serve our common purposes if it, too, is subjected to active oversight and control. Mitchell and Meissen, uh, Meissen, uh, Meissen in 2008. The two visions of the economy can be summarized in value terms uh, as individualistic, uh, which is in figure 8.1, and collectively or collectivist, wait a minute, yeah, collectivist, uh, which would be 8.2. For progressive economists, collective will is important because it provides the political justification for more uh, equally sharing the cost and benefits of economic activity. Progressives have historically argued that government has an obligation to create work if the private market falls, fails to create enough employment. Thus, the government is empowered to spend as much as it takes to ensure there are enough jobs available for all who want to work. The context between the two visions outlined in Figure 8.1 and 8.2 has spawned a long-running academic debate. It played out during the Great Depression, which taught us that policy intervention is vital in order to rein in the chaotic and damaging forces of greed and power that underpin the capitalist monetary system. We learned that so-called market signals do not deliver satisfactory levels of, of employment and that the system can easily come to rest with mass unemployment. We learned that this malaise was, was brought about by a lack of spending and that the government had the spending capacity to redress these shortfalls and to ensure all those who wanted to work could do so. From the Great Depression and in, uh, in response to it, we learned that the economy is a construct and not a deity and that we could control it through fiscal and monetary policy in order to create desirable collective outcomes. We un understood that the economy is our creation then designated to, do to deliver collective benefits, not an abstract entity that uh distributes rewards or punishes or punishment uh punishments according to some moral framework the government is not a moral uh, arbiter but a functional entity serving our needs people's experience experiences during this period led to a complete rejection of <coughs> neoclassical macroeconomics by Keynes and others uh which will be in uh, chapter 11 and 12. The OPEC oil price hikes in 1970s provided the switch point, or yeah, switch point that saw the conservative ideas represented uh, represented in the Figure 8.1 regain ascendancy, despite the, their ideas have been cast into dis, uh, disru, disrepute, uh, disrepute during the 1930s. Okay. Anyway, the resurgence of the free market paradigm since that time has been accompanied by well-crafted 
public campaign where framing and metaphor triumph over operational reality or theoretical superior, superiority. This funds this process has been assisted by business and business <laughs> by business and other anti-government interests, which have provided significant funds to emergent conservative free market think tanks. Better argues that these in, in, institution institutions fine-tuned the art of direct conclusions or yeah, conclusions tailored their studies to suit their clients or donors and from 99 uh, yeah, okay. politicians paradigm uh, parade their uh, these so-called independent research findings as the authority needed to justify their deregulation agendas and the distortion to the policy debate in uh, is reinforced by the erroneous claims uh, em emanating uh, from the think tanks I'll be right back Hey, and welcome back. Uh, don't forget to subscribe, by the way, comment, like, share, hit the bell if you want to learn more about MMT through my uh, reading of the textbook. Anyway, uh, now on uh, 8.4, Cognitive Frames and Economic Commentary. An overview of the assumptions that underpin cognitive linguistics and co cognitive philosophy on, can help to explain why it has been difficult to mount a coherent challenge to orthodox macroeconomics view of Lekov and Johnson, uh, make three uh, make three basic claims: the mind is inherently Im embodied; two, thought is most con unconscious, mostly unconscious; and three, abstract concepts are largely metaphorical. We can summarize what this means in the following way embodiment relates to everyday activities such as grasping you know, grasping something with our hands or standing and walking. We relate these f uh, physical actions uh, via the use of metaphors uh, to try to understand the world around us. For example, we understand the concepts associated with more or less in terms of direction up or down as consequences a consequence of our physical experience of interacting with our in, uh, environment metaphors concept the metaphors concerned with direction are also employed in our reasoning about being happy or sad as in that was an uplifting film or i'm feeling down a success of or failure as in they are climbing the corporate ladder or they have fallen from the grave falling from grace when I think about quantity in terms of direction, uh, such a, that more in constant conceptualized as an upward trend, and less in figured as uh, is less in figured as downwards, in relations to our general thinking about money, more is typically good and less is typically bad. The idea that a, that a that a bigger fiscal deficit can be described uh, desirable thing is thus. Con counterintuitive in a very basic sense. The development of an economic uh, pedagogy. I'm, I'm not familiar. I'm not familiar with, with this word, but anyway, uh, pedagogy and an understanding of the policy opportunities arising from a more com complete understanding of macroeconomic. Terms need to be communicated in a way that exploits our capacity to construe the same information in different ways. 8.5. Dominant metaphors and economic commentary. The mainstream the theoretical models in macroeconomics that re reinforce the figure 8.1 perspective do not embrace the basic characteristics of the real-world economic and consistency consistently perform poorly when evaluated against their predict predictive accuracy of real-world events. We have already noted that the dominance of the mainstream macroeconomics narrative in the public domain is achieved through a series of linked myths that are reinforced with strong metaphors. Table 8.1 shows some of the popular examples of metaphors used by mainstream economists and commentators. 
to focus their attack on government spending, deficits, public debt, and income supported support payments for the most disadvantaged workers. As we learn to and learn in section 8.4, each of these metaphors is designed to reinforce the main core values that the mainstream paradigm seeks to promote, such as self-discipline, independence, ambition, wealth, and sacrifice. Uh, these metaphors obscure the truth and lead us to the support of policies that, that make us worse off, even when they are alternatives that would make us all in collective sense better off. Face-to-face -face mainstream macro and MMT uh, 8.6. The implicit metaphors buried in terms such as those in Table 8.1 reinforce a series of propositions promoted by mainstream economists to focus their attack on government intervention. In the remaining chapters, we provide an alternative theoretical approach to reveal the fallacies inherent in mainstream macroeconomic, macroeconomics. In the remaining sections of this chapter, we summarize the relevant operational reality as presented by MMT, which we develop in detail throughout the rest of this textbook. Uh, Mosler, 97 to 98, Mitchell, 98, Ray, uh, Ray 98, Mitchell and Muskin, uh, 2008. As we will see, these co counter and metaphors presented in, in uh, 8.1. Well, I did tell you I was reading from my books. There you go. <laughs> At least you can hear the page turnings. Anyway, uh, mainstream policy. Uh, well, first, let me kind of look at the table 8.1, examples of neoclassical macroeconomic metaphors. Uh, government spending, metaphorical claim, the nation is living beyond its means, implied meaning, excess spending requires sacrifice cuts needed immediately. Uh, also, uh, fiscal balance? Maybe it does. Uh, no, no, different one. Uh, also, in the same category of, of government spending, a na nation has maxed out to its credit card spending like a drunken sailor. Uh, in the implied meaning, run out of money due to irresponsible spending, uh, wanton irresponsibility and delinquent behavior, fiscal balance, uh, budget uh, black hole, uh, or deteriorating state of the budget. In the implied meaning of those two, uh, the first one is budget beyond human control, like the collapse of massive uh, of a massive star. Uh, the other one is budget is like a body and is in state of ill health and requiring emergency surgery. There is no alternative, or Tina. Uh, let's see, also in the same category, it looks like yeah, um, mushrooming budget deficits, uh, also meaning budget is an organic entity that has grown out of control. Uh, another one in the metro, uh, metaphorical claim is, let's see, the nation has run out of money, it, it is broke. In the implied meaning, it's uh, government budget is like a household budget, the economy is like us. Public debt, the, na the nation is bankrupt, the public debt maintain a uh, mountain burden our, our grandchildren. The actual, the, the meaning of those is a nation is uh, is a badly managed insolvent firm. Debt is da uh, dangerous and uh, insurmountable. Debt threatens fundamental unit of society, the family, and undermines future prosperity. Uh, let's see. Uh, another part of public debt, uh, the metaphorical claim, uh, is the nation has run out of money and it, well, no, I've already said that, um, Public debt, uh, the nation is bankrupt, the public debt mount, mountain, uh, burdening our grandchildren and mortgaging the future. I've already said the, the nation is a badly managed uh, and self firm. Debt is dangerous and insurmountable. Debt threatens fundamental units of society, uh, the family, and the undermine, and undermines future prosperity. Current government debt compromises future spending. That's the mortgage of the future part. Uh, income support, welfare dependency, uh, also meaning welfare net is like a drug for the populace, encouraging ill health and addiction. Uh, dull bludgers, receivers, okay, so those two are another metaphorical claim. 
and the implied means of those is unemployed people are lazy and, and underserving. Okay, so this is mainstream policy number one. The government faces the same budget constraints in, as a household. Many of the wi widely used metaphors, like those in Table 8.1, seek to directly equate government spending uh, with that of reckless individual households or, or uh, splurging on credit card debt, neglecting to pay the mortgage, or failing to care for their children. The household budget analogy is false. Households can use the currency and, and households are use the currency and must finance their spending. A sovereign government issues the currency and must spend before it can subsequently tax or borrow. A currency issuing government uh, can never be revenue constrained in a technical sense. It can sustain deficits indefinitely without insolvency risk. Implications. The household budget analogy is inapplicable to a currency issuing government. Our uh, second one to that is the implication is our personal budget experience generates no relevant insights uh, when we and an analyze government's outlays of revenues. And third is an alternative narrative must highlight the special characteristics of the government's currency monopoly. That is the government's currency monopoly. Mainstream policy number two, fiscal deficits or surpluses are bad or good. Fiscal deficits are neither good nor bad. In accounting terms, they equal the non-government surplus. In behavioral terms, they are required when the spending intentions of the non-government sector are insufficient to ensure full utilization of the available productive resources. The context matters because the fiscal outcome is a vehicle to achieving social economic goals rather than the end in itself. Similarly, fiscal surpluses are neither good nor bad and may be harmful in some circumstances for a nation with strong net exports, quality of public services, and national income levels sufficient to support the private sector saving desires. A surplus may be required to contain nominal aggregate demand and avoid inflation. There are two problems with using the term fiscal deficit. First, while many speak as if a fiscal deficit is a policy choice made by the government, in fact, the fiscal outcome is determined by the state of overall activity and is largely beyond the control of government. If private spending is weak, then a deficit will typically rise as tax revenue declines. Movements in the fiscal balance are thus ambiguous. A given fiscal outcome can result either because the government has taken discretionary fiscal policy decisions to maintain full employment given the spending and saving decision of the non-government sector or because non-government spending has fallen and automatic stabilizers have had to uh, have had led to a decline in tax revenue, net uh, transfers, and an increase in unemployment. When private spending collapses and the deficit rises, the correct response is to increase discretionary net public spending, not cut it. Government does not budget for a fiscal for a fiscal deficit. Instead, whether a fiscal result uh, results and how a government ought to react to the budgetary outcome depends on the performances of performance of the economy. Second, the term has a negative connotation behind because the deficit signifies a shortfall, which, while accurate in an account sense, is highly misleading in the context of the, po uh, the positive cons uh, contribution that deficit makes to the net financial wealth in the non-government sector. Government deficits are the sole source of net financial assets for a non-government sector. All transactions become uh, between agents in a non-government sector need to be net uh, sector net to zero. This accounting reality means that if the non-government sector wants to net save in the currency of issue, then the government has to be in deficit. The sectoral balance derived from the national accounts 
generalize this result and show that the government deficit or surplus always equals the non-government surplus or deficit. Fiscal surpluses destroy private wealth by forcing the private sector to liquidate its wealth and get cash and destroy liquidity uh, or debiting reserve accounts, which is deflationary. With an external deficit, fiscal surpluses result in increasing private domestic sector debt levels and cannot represent a sustainable long-term growth strategy. Ultimately, the decision by the private se domestic sector to increase its net saving and, re and reduce its debt levels will interact with the fiscal drag coming from the surpluses and force the economy into recession. The cyclical component of the budget will then push the deficit back into a bad, or into a bad deficit. Implications. Understanding the context in which a particular fiscal outcome occurs is crucial to a, reason, to a reasoned uh, assessment of the appropriateness of the fiscal position. The fact that a, f a fiscal deficit allows the non-government sector to save overall and fiscal surplus to destroy non-government wealth should be understood and promoted. Mainstream fallacy number three, fiscal surpluses contribute to national savings. A currency issuing government does not save in its own currency. Fiscal surpluses do not represent a public saving. Uh, they can be used to fund future public expenditure. Saving is an act of foregoing current spending to enhance future spending possibilities and applies to a financially constrained non-government entity such as a household. Fiscal surpluses provide no greater capacity to governments to meet future uh, financial debt needs nor do fiscal deficits erode the, the, that capacity. Constraints on government spending are not financial, but defined by the ex accessibility of real resources that, available, that are available for sale in the currency that the government issues. Uh, okay, so that, I'll begin the policy 70 pretty soon. <laughs> Implications. A currency issuing government needs uh, never needs prior funds in order to spend and thus never needs to save. Fiscal, uh, fiscal surpluses or deficits destroy or uh, augment non-government financial wealth. Mainstream policy number four, the fiscal outcome should be balanced over the economy uh, economic cycle. Recognizing that the fiscal outcome is uh, ind indigenous means that the government cannot realistically target a particular outcome because changes in private spending, for example, can thwart any efforts to make or efforts made by the government uh, to achieve the target. Responsible strategy for government is to allow its fiscal balance to adjust adjust to level of net spending required to achieve full employment given the spending decisions of the non-government sector irrespective of the state of the business cycle the national accounts tell us that for for a nation with the external deficit a balanced budget rule is tantamount tantamount excuse me to requiring the private domestic sector to second to record a deficit of equal magnitude to the external deficit this is an unlikely to be sustainable strategy Further, a counter-cyclical fiscal strategy does not require the government to achieve a surplus. The concept of uh, counter-cyclicality <laughs> more correctly refers to the direction of change, uh, of change rather than the level of the fiscal outcome. The government should not increase its discretionary net spending if the economy is already at full capacity and is satisfied with the private spending mix. Such an expansion would pro pro-cyclical, but a fiscal stance that results in steady deficit is desirable where the external deficit is steady and the private domestic sector is saving overall. Implications. Fiscal rules defined in terms of public debt or deficit ratios are unlikely to be consistent with the responsibility or responsible management of fiscal policy. A currency issuing government should pursue functional targets such as full employment and allow to its fiscal outcome to adjust accordingly. Mainstream policy number five, fiscal deficits drive up interest rates and crowd out private investment because they compete for scarce private saving. This is a specific version of policy number two. 
While currency issuing government do not need to sell bonds, the fact that they do create uh, no competition for final or finite savings between public and pri private borrowers. First, government deficits uh, stimulate growth in private savings as national income grows. Second, the funds that the government absorbs when it sells bonds to the non-government sector ultimately originate from the net financial asset created by past deficits. Third, bank lending is not reserve con constrained and banks will extend loans to any creditworthy customer. If the banks are short of reserves, they then they borrow from each other in the interbank market. Ultimately, they can always borrow from the central bank. For that reason, selling government bonds to banks does not reduce the capacity of banks to make loans to, to customers. Moreover, the, the deficits place downward pressure on interest rates. Debt assurance serves to allow the central bank to maintain a positive target interest rate by providing investors with the interest-bearing asset that drains the excess reserves in the banking system, resulting from deficit spending. If these reserves were not drained, then the then uh, then in an environment of government deficits, the overnight interest rate would fall due to com competition by banks to rid themselves of the non-profitable reserves, and this might compromise the central bank target rate uh, interest rate unless it offers a return on excess reserves, which most do. Implications. Central banks use public debt as part of an interest rate targeted strategy. Public debt does not fund government spending. Currency issuing government do not need to borrow. Mainstream fallacy number six. Fiscal deficits mean higher taxes in the future. Taxes reserve uh, taxes serve ma many purposes of reducing private sector purchasing power, reducing consum consumption of harmful goods and services such as tobacco and so on, but none of these purposes relate to funding government spending. In a fiat currency system where the currency has no intrinsic worth, the government needs to transfer real goods and services from the non-government to the government sector to facilitate its economic and social program. In this context, a primary function of taxation is to promote effort and offers from private individuals to government of goods and services to in return for the necessary funds to extinguish tax liabilities. The crucial point is that the funds necessary to pay the tax liabilities are provided to the non-government sector by government spending. Accordingly, Government spending, if sufficient, uh, provides the paid work which eliminates the unemployment created by the taxes. By depriving the non-government sector of purchasing power, taxes uh, attenuate aggregate demand so that government can create a non-inflationary real resources sp space on uh, accommodating spending uh, public spending. Importantly, uh, importantly, every generation can freely choose to choose the level of taxation it pays because it, it is it determines through the public process the size of the government and the re real resources space re real resource space it will utilize. Past fiscal deficits never need to be paid back by the government generated uh, generation, or current generation, or by any future generation. Implications: Pro, uh, Progressives should refer to money uh, to public money rather than taxpayer money. Taxpayers do not fund government spending. Taxes are required to reduce the capacity of the non-government sector to command real goods and services, so that the government can utilize them. Mainstream fallacy number seven: The government will run out of fiscal space or money if it overspends. This is related to uh, fallacies one, five, and six. Conservative politicians and economic commentators often claim the government appear, appear wait the government will run out of money. It does not curb spending if they do not curb spending. They attempt to give the statement authority uh, authority by appealing to our intuition and experience via the household budget analogy to claim that governments, like households, have to live within their means. This analogy resonates strongly with voters because it is easily related, relatable. We intuitively understand that as individuals, we cannot live beyond our means indefinitely. 
and currency issuing government has no intrinsic financial constraints. Government will never run out of money to build a hospital or pay health professionals, but the materials to, bu to build a fa facility and skilled workers to run it may not may not be available. Fiscal space is thus more accurately defined as the real goods and services available for sale in the currency of issue. These are the means available to the government to fulfill its social economic charter. The currency issuing government can always purchase whatever is for sale in its own currency. This fallacy is also related to the intergenerational or aging population claims that pension and healthcare systems will be sustainable will be unsustainable in the future. There are no financial constraints to stop the currency issuing government providing first class health care and or pensions in the future. The challenge of uh, rising dependency ra ratios will be whether productivity grow, uh, growth ensures there there are adequate real goods and services available to maintain growth in living standards with fewer workers available. These are not financial constraints. Another uh, related claim is that the sovereign issue of currency is at risk of default if the public debt ratio rises above some threshold, often construed as 80%, and as long as the government only issues debt in its own currency and provides no assurance about the convertibility into another currency, the, the, the default risk is zero. Implications. Fiscal space is not defined in terms of some given financial ratio, such as the public debt ratio. Two, fiscal space refers to the extent of the, avail the available real resources that the government is, is able to utilize in pursuit of a social economic program. Number three, there is no default risk for debt issued by a government in its own currency. Mainstream fallacy number eight, government spending is inflationary. All spending, uh, private or public, is inflationary if it derives normal aggregate demand above the real capacity of the, ec the economy to absorb it. Increased government spending is not inflationary if there are idle real resources that can be bought, brought back into productive use, for example, unemployment. Related fallacies include claims that issuing bonds to the central bank, the so-called printing money, Option to value the currency, whereas issuing bonds to the private sector reduces the inflation risk of deficits. Now, their claim is true. First, there is no dip, uh, difference in the inflation risk attached to a particular level of net public spending when the government matches its deficit with bond issuance rela relative to a situation where it issues. Issues no bonds. Uh, bond purchases reflect uh, portfolio decisions regarding how private wealth is held. If the funds that we use for our bond purchases were spent on goods and services as an alternative, then the fiscal deficit would be lower as a result. Second, the provision of credit by the central bank in return for treasury bonds will only be inflationary if there is no fiscal space, see fallacy number seven. Hyperinflation examples such as the 1920s Germany and Zimbabwe in the early 2000s do not support the claim that deficits cause inflation. In both cases, there were major reductions in supply capacity of the economy prior to the inflation episode, such as here, right now. We have a supply chain problem that was caused by, oh, I don't know, the repeal of uh, Glass-Steagall, as far as I'm concerned, allowing multiple companies to go overseas for cheaper labor and be able to sell us, sell it back to us at a higher price. Anyway, uh, we'll be right back. Hey, welcome back. Uh, implications from the last one I just did. Uh, when the economy is in, is at full employment, all spending carries in, uh, an inflation risk and issuing, uh, issue, issuing treasury bonds does not uh, mitigate the risk associated with public spending. 
Government spending, by the way, it's number two. Government spending should seek to bring idle resources back into productive use. And three, limits of non-government public spending are de defined by the fiscal space available, in which in turn is a functional uh, function, excuse me, of the available of, uh, availability of idle resources. See a pattern there? Mainstream policy number nine, fiscal deficits lead to big government. Fiscal deficits may reflect any size of government, even small governments, with will need to run continuous deficits if there is a desire within the non-government sector to save overall and the policy aim to is to maintain full employment levels of national income. Economic theory does not specify uh, in optimal size of government. The call for smaller government reflects a purely ideological stance with no basis of, uh, in economic theory. The size of government will reflect the preferences of the population for public provision of goods and services and infrastructure. Imp uh, implication. The size of government is a political choice rather than an economic necessity. Uh, number two, even small governments will typically run continuous deficits to maintain full employment. Now, 8.7, Framing ma uh, and Macroeconomics Narrative. While MMT provides an internally consistent and empirically robust account of the way the, the economy works, it also clearly challenges the way in which humans think about macroeconomic concepts. But through careful use of language and avoiding the established macroeconomics metaphors, we can develop a coherent understanding of conceptual framework developed in this textbook. Language and metaphor examples. The primary metaphor, oops, the primary metaphor purposes are destination relates to the subject uh, subject judgment that we want to achieve purposes and we succeed when we reach a destination. MMT defines the destination in terms of people rather than in terms of an independent economy. For example, we might define our goals as define our goal as full employment or a zero waste of people. This destination is reached when not when the public de de debt ratio is X percent, but when all those who want to work can find a job. For example, when unemployment when measured unemployment is less than two percent and there is zero unemployment. That is the desired specific destination and allows us to adopt a, pos a positive focus to our analysis. If we become caught up debating financial ratios, such as the size of fiscal deficits and the like, we merely reinforce the conservative frames about sacrifice, solvency, and rectitude, uh, which is in Table 8.1. A key issue that concerns language and terminology, uh, as Shanker Osorio notes, the term spending may be no longer uh, may no longer be problematic because to spend means to use up. This implies that what is spent was finite, has now gone, and is the user of, uh, is no longer with us. The language supports supports uh, erroneous assumptions that about what a government that is the sovereign issuer of its own currency does with its money. While MMT teaches us that uh, teaches us the reality that government spending injects net financial assets into the system to meet critical human needs, uh, our language has to reinforce rather than uh, rather than undermine that understanding. We we might need to need uh, we we might then say that government spending puts money in our pockets, while government taxing takes money out of our pockets. This is not only more accurate, but it also provides a different connotation to both government spending and government def deficits, that is, to put more money into our pockets than taken out through taxes. Still, spending retains a negative connotation even when applied to private sector spending. While we like the benefits of our spending a nice restaurant dinner, for example, 
we do not like spending our money. Instead of focusing attention on the act of spending, we need to focus on the results of government spending. Rather than saying government spending, government spend, we might instead say uh, the government invests to enhance our purposes. Uh, invest in a, is a term we, read, we readily relate to wealth creation that is building up, not using up. This invokes the more uh, more is up metaphor, which re re reverses the current negative connotation of spending. Similarly, the term budget deficit has two negative connotations. First, using budget triggers the fallacious uh, household analogy. Second, deficit signifies a shortfall and failure. Throughout this textbook, we use the term uh, fiscal deficit and skew the descriptor budget to avoid invoking the household analogy. The term deficit is clearly accurate in an accounting sense, but highly misleading in the context of the uh, contribution that a fiscal um, deficit makes to the net financial wealth of the non-government sector. But try to replace, but trying to replace rather, the term deficit would almost certainly result in a total loss of meaning. Further complicating the. Uh, is it pedagogy? Pedagogy? I'm not even sure how to pronounce that. Anyway, but uh, just so you know, it's a P E D A G O G Y. Um, I'm, I'm not really sure how to pronounce that, so I'm just going to spell it out. Anyway, uh, we thus do not invent a uh, new term for uh, deficits, but rather seek to exploit the more is a metaphor to advance uh, to advantage by always relating the government deficits to its non-government uh, manifestation, namely the rise in net financial assets that a deficit provides. So we can say, the government deficit rose and generated high levels of wealth for households and firms. This type of language also uh, more aggressively invokes that what is known as the event structure metaphor, which, uh, uh, positions purposes uh, as destinations uh, to be reached. Um, the des destination must be pro uh, prominent in the narrative, and then we must specify the, cause the causal change through which the purposes are achieved. Causation is linked to concepts of force movement where, for example, we might say that the government deficit is the uh, application of a force, no, wait, uh, yeah, application of force, the injection of net financial assets, which causes a change in of state, higher income, employment, or wealth. Lakoff and Johnson say the concept of force movement suggests to us that the movement would not have occurred without the application of the force. That is, the economy is a construct rather than a natural self uh, equilibrating. Uh, system beyond our control and that the, that the improvements in national income or employment was the direct result of the cause, uh, result of the cause, the, uh, the government stimulus. People respond to the logic where, where causes are forces and causation is force movement. Concepts that uh, are framed in this way are more easily learned and understood. Under the the economy as a natural system or deity pr paradigm, government uh, regulations and interventions are unnecessary and dam damaging. In the MMT alternative, the same actions force movement towards our desired destinations. Without the force, the current state that does not change and the goals are thus not achieved. We want government to act on our behalf to move us from state A, uh, less desirable, to state B, closer to our purpose. It is important to note that the economy uh, has no goals. They are, they are our goals, and we use, manage, and control the economy to achieve our goals. Further, careful choice of frames to promote in the public debate is important. For example, while conservatives focus on concepts such as tax relief to attack government progressives, uh, to attack government progressives should frame the debate by emphasizing the need for unemployment relief, a frame that makes unemployment painful and reduction in the pain and desire goal. 
with uh, wait, a firm that makes unemployment gainful and a reduction in the uh, pain a desired goal. Okay. Let's see. Page one thirty. Relating, uh, uh, relatedly, we avoid debating within the frames that conservatives use. For example, attacking the implementation of fiscal austerity as being too fast still implies. Concedes that the desirable alternative is a more gradual, uh, managed uh, arrival uh, at the same goal, a reduction in the government deficit. Uh, the more productive frame would be to expl explicate the functional role of government deficits and continually reference the human cost of conservative policies. A demand for relief from high unemployment reframes the reference the uh, the human cost of conservative policy. Oh wait, excuse me. Reframes the uh, debate and focuses on the failure by the by conservative forces to reach. The desired destination, access to employment, every statement must reinforce the purposes and destination that define how we feel about policy. Fiscal space. In Chapter 22, we outline the concept of fiscal space. The National Account Convention shows show that the government deficit always equals the non-government surplus, and the government surplus always equals the non-government deficit. As we learn in Chapter 6, the combination of external deficits and a desire by the private domestic sector to save overall means that the non-government sector will act as a drain on overall spending in relation to income flows. This means a continuous fiscal deficit is required to sustain a given level of economic activity. It is thus a normal state for a, na for a nation to have continuous government deficits over in over each economic cycle, uh, rising and falling with fluctuations in non-government sector net spending. Rarely will a government surplus be appropriate. Further, the government deficits are not just appropriate in times of recession or slow growth. They are required whenever there is a non-government desire for a surplus, which is the typical case. We might thus continually reinforce the frame. Government spending, sorry, government deficits are normal, surpluses are atypical. This means that balanced budgets over the cycle type arguments are destructive and fall into misleading deficits are bad frame. We thus frame the concept of fiscal space in terms of the idle real resources that can be brought into pro productive use via higher government spending and, and or lower taxation. The idle resources signal that the government deficit is too low or the surplus is too large. The desired destination is zero waste and the required action is a large def larger deficit. <clears throat> Excuse me. Cost of public program. The emphasis on real resource available as the uh, demarcation of fiscal space is also related to a frame linked to cost. We often hear or read statements such as one, the cost to the taxpayer of program A are huge. Number two, the nation cannot afford the cost of that program. If we were to take a public employment program that required government to spend X billion in wages, uh, capital equipments, administration, and oversight, we might reasonably ask about the cost of that program. The conservative program tells us that the cost is X, the figure that appears in the annual fiscal do document against the program. And MMT frame considers this X in the fiscal papers to be of little interest. The actual cost of the program is the change in co it causes in, to, in the usage of real resources, more consumption by the formerly unemployed workers who now have jobs, some equipment and project supervision costs, and so on. An additional cost would be the opportunity cost of such a program, which are minimal, minimal given that the unemployed are idle. In fact, 
in this frame, the increased use of the real resources provides benefits to both the individuals and society so that so the use of the term cost would be misleading. When we ask whether the nation can afford a policy initiative, we should ignore the X and consider what real resources are available and the potential cost of putting unemployed resources to work, which would be that would be nearly zero plus the cost of shifting already employed workers to uh, the government program. Opportunity cost, the available real resources constitutes the fiscal space. The fiscal space should then always be related to the purposes to which we aspire and the destination we wish to reach. The MMT alternative framing, in Chapter 8.2, we, we present a summary of the MMT alternatives to the framing that were that was presented in Table 8.1. Compar comparison of a uh, Table 8.2 with Table 8.1 will make clear how different the um, d uh, two approaches are. We can make use of our understanding of linguistics to provide a framing consistent with the with the policy space available to sovereign current sovereign nations that issue their own currency. Uh, table eight point two examples of MMT macroeconomic metaphors. Government spending. Government spending puts money in our pockets. Uh, governments invest in the productive capacity of our nation. And government cannot run out of money. The true constraint is our nation's resources. The implied meaning of the first one, government spending increases non-government income. Number two, government spending increases our capacity to provide for the needs of our population. Number three, there is no financial constraint, although there could be a resource constraint. Uh, the fiscal balance uh, category. There are, looks like three of the metaphor claim. Uh, the first one being government deficits allow us to save. Number two would be government surplus equal non-governmental deficits. Uh, number three, the fiscal policy balances are largely determined by the, uh, the uh, economy's performance. Number four, those three was, was four. The nation cannot run out of its own money. That's true. The implied meaning behind these are, first, the government deficits equal non-government surpluses. Number two, government surpluses reduce non-government uh, financial saving. Number three, fi fiscal balance outcome is not discretionary. Uh, number four, government budget is not like a household budget. Now we're going to public debt. Uh, the government debt is our asset. That's a, meta a metaphorical claim. Uh, and the implied meaning to that is government debt provides a risk-free financial as asset to strengthen non-government portfolios. And government debt helps to stabilize the financial system. Income support. We take care of our own. And number two. A good nation supports its people. And three, a good nation helps to support those in our nation who needs who need help. And in the uh, implied meaning of the last three I just I spoke of, as our government faces no financial constraints, it uses its fiscal capacity to ensure resources are mobilized to care for its population. Number two. Unemployment is always evidence of a policy failure. A failure is to, a failure to put resources to work. And number three to that, and last one, uh, in the implied meaning, uh, rich nations help to mobilize resources needed to poor, needed by poor nations. The conclusion of this chapter is MMT provides an accurate description of how the monetary system actually operates the decision to pursue a policy framework consistent with uh, 8.1 individualistic uh, or, or figure 8.2 collect collectivism is purely ideological. 
the orthodox economic rhetoric associated with figure 8.1 trades on an in incom incomplete understanding of macroeconomic real realities and exploits powerful metaphors to ensure that these realities and related policy opportunities are obscured from vision. And here's a reminder, tomorrow I will be on chapter, oh, and yeah, chapter B, currency, money, and banking. Uh, also chapter nine, the same thing, by introducing introductions to the sovereign currency, the government, and his money. Please join me tomorrow for that chapter. Please subscribe. Please hit the like button. Hit, uh, please comment. Uh, please share and hit the bell. And thanks for listening. I uh, hope you enjoyed yourself. I hope you enjoyed listening with me uh, or listening while I try to uh, read from the textbook, uh, as you see on the screen. Uh, U.S., thanks again for, for being here. Uh, peace out for now. Subscribe. Hit the bell. Comment. Like and share. Peace out for now.